the evolutions of consciousness, man versus the machines in the future. And when I was looking at Star Wars, I saw that George Lucas was actually celebrating the point of how Satan fell from the light to the dark. Darth Vader is the devil, and that whole Star Wars, Wars episode, the Star Wars, the Wars in Heaven, is how, how Darth Vader failed. And it just kind of blew my mind when I saw that. I was like, wow, no one has ever done the point of view of the walk of Christ or the path, you know, why he came upon the earth and what his whole journey and walk was about. And so I thought about why not put the second coming of Christ, not the first, because the first coming is told in the Bible. But in Revelations, it just mentions that Christ would come back. But there was no story until I wrote The Terminator and the Matrix, which is the third eye. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people need to understand that my script and my book, and it was two things, and I, you know, there were three things in all that I created because I created a script. It's a movie treatment. That's a form of script. That shows you how it looks upon the screen or the camera directions and the book and the graphics and the special effects and the characters, 80, copyrights 81, 83, and 84. Anyway, <clears throat> I wrote the movie treatment first. The 1981 copywritten treatment was written first. And I knew that Lucas had directed Star Wars, but I didn't know that he also wrote it. So I was looking for him, and that's how my work got to be sent to Fox. It would have never probably gotten sent there if I, if I hadn't known that Lucas was not attached to Fox. You know, I was looking for Lucas, George Lucas. And I sent my work over, and a vice president, Susan Nesbitt, got my movie treatment, the 81 copywritten movie treatment. She loved it. And she wrote me a letter, and she, she did a lot of phone calls, and she wanted to know, did I have anything else written on it, because Fox was interested in buying it. And they thought it was phenomenal. And I told her, yes, yeah, I wrote a book also, but I hadn't finished the book. And so she said, well, when the book is finished, we want you to send that to Fox also. And I said, okay. <clears throat> but while the, at the time, I didn't even know that they were creating the Terminator behind my back. Uh, they were giving me the runaround this whole time, and I'm thinking, you know, um, that they are going to buy it. And then the next thing I know, I get another letter from uh, Laura Lee, the story editor at uh, Fox, and she said, yeah, while we understand there was some interest in, you know, them buying it, the people that first set out to buy it had all left Fox and moved. Some of them had moved over to Paramount. And we're talking about, like, Susan Mesbach and David the, the, the producer David Madden, M-A-D-D-E-N or M-A-D-D-I-N, whatever his name is spelled. Uh, because when I got the book, when I finished reading the, writing the book, um, I put in a call to Susan Nesbeck, the vice president, and she had moved over to Paramount. But she still remembered me, and I said, yeah, I finished that book. And she said, well, yeah, send it over to David Madden's office via Valerie Red over at Fox. And that's what I did. And like I told you before, I got the runaround, and next thing I know, um, I'm, it's 1999, March the 31st at the national release, and I'm looking at the Matrix, and I'm like, wow, that's my work. I wrote that. Wow. And then I contacted Warner Brothers, because I had sent my work to the Wachowski Brothers in 1986, summer of 86, and they had put an ad out in a magazine. The Buyer's Guide is what the magazine was called, and a lot of the fans recall this because a lot of the fans saw that. And anyway, they were looking for a science fiction manuscript to do into a comic book. Well, there was two things that I wanted my work to be. One was a movie and two, a comic book, because as a kid I grew up on comic books and I always loved comic books, and I thought, wow, this is phenomenal. And they were in Chicago at that time. And so I sent them my movie treatment, my characters, my special effects, my graphics, and my 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 uh, script. I even also sent them some of my notes because um, I felt like if you wanted to do a comic book, it has to be complete. You got to know every aspect. Hello, are you there? Okay, this is Sophia. Are you there? Yes. Where did I leave off? Because I didn't even realize the phone had fallen dead. Wow! Wow! Oh, yeah, it just went off. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, wow, it just cut off right in middle. You were you were telling us about um, 
Um, the uh, as you had submitted your 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 um, your work as you uh, uh, it was 1986 you had submitted your work and uh, that's uh, the last that we had heard of it uh, you had given it to yeah, the yeah uh, well, no I had I had first said I had submitted my my work in 81 to Fox you heard that part then yeah. 86 to the Wachowski brothers for the Matrix hello yes oh, yeah. I'm here. okay yeah. I had, yeah, the second was to uh, the Wachowskis in 1986, but in 1981 it was to Fox. And I didn't know that James Cameron and Gail and Hurd was already creating the Terminator with my work. <laughs> I had no idea until 19, till 2001 when the FBI told me. Because they went to the U.S. Attorney's Office in 1999, and I told them, uh, that I wrote The Matrix, and did they want to prosecute the case? And they told me yes. And they told me first to go to the FBI, let the FBI investigate it, and then they would prosecute the case. So I took the case over to the FBI, and they pulled the copyrights, and the first thing they did was start investigating. And then they told me that I wrote not only The Matrix, but I had written The Terminator also. Wow. That's right. They told me that the protective expression and the substantial similarities were all was in the introductions of both the Matrix and the Terminator. Hmm. And they they were supposed to have prosecuted the case. I should have never gone to court. People need to understand I wasn't going to court to prove I wrote the Matrix. That was a civil case because the criminal investigations had already been done and established me as the writer. That civil case was for money. They were trying to block me from getting money from 1981 up until the present. That's what that case was all about, money mm. and royalties. Right, right. Now, they, wow. they, openly, they openly admitted, any, any media, anybody want to see it, I can give it to them. In the court document, Warner Brothers and Fox openly admitted that they stole the Terminator from me, and they thought that the statutes of limitation would save them, that it had been over 20 years or 20-some years, and that the, that the statutes of limitations prevented me from getting any money from 1981. But the judge had cautioned them in that court case of 2003 in California that the moment of discovery or the, the discovery of theft starts at, you know, at the moment of, dis, you know, the, the theft starts at the moment of discovering it. And I didn't discover the theft until 2001. So, therefore, the statutes of limitations couldn't apply to me because I didn't know about the theft until 2001 when the FBI told me. But I had them in court by 2003 because you, you have a statute of limitations of three years after discovery of theft to get them into the court system. Right. So I had them there. Now, I have a transcript that's in the federal courts that anybody who want to look at it, media, anybody, lawyers, whoever, is, is talking, to, uh, Bruce Isaac, one of Brothers and Fox's lawyer, is talking to the judge, Judge Morrow, who used to work with Warner Brothers, and one of my lawyers, Michael T. Stoller, well, he's one of my former lawyers, he also used to work with Warner Brothers, and they were working with Warner Brothers before they got on my case and before Michael Stoller came to join me as my attorney. Anyway, in the transcript, um, uh, Bruce Isaac, one of Brothers' lawyer, is talking to the judge, Judge Morrow, and, and he's, uh, he's asking Judge Morrow, how can he get summary judgment against me? Well, Judge Morrow told him that if there were any substantial similarities, that she could not grant him summary judgment, period. Wow. He also told Judge Morrow that he was worried about my RICO case. Because under the anti-counterfeiting statutes, you could go to jail for everything that you, any derivatives you make of a copyright, you could go to jail for that. And so um, he, w he was worried about that. And she told him that if no evidence was put in during discovery, that, you know, he shouldn't worry about it because, you know, that RICO could get dismissed if there was no evidence put in. What Bruce Isaac and David Boring did was, with the help of my attorneys that they sent to sabotage the case, misconduct, and fraud, they prevented me from putting any evidence into the court system. They also prevented me from doing a deposition or going to the courts and speaking for myself because once I spoke for myself, um, the fraudulent admissions that they had put into the courts would be nullified and invalid and would show that they had committed fraud on the court system. In other words, they put in fraudulent admissions saying that I admitted to not even my work being the same 
I admitted to not even giving them any work. Just a whole bunch of lies.